In the headlines, the Caribbean Court of Justice will rule next Wednesday in the case to quash the Court of Appeal decision on its jurisdiction to hear the election's case. United States high-ranking government official Mike Pompeo has instructed his department to take action against anyone who seeks to undermine democracy in Guyana. The new army chief says the GDF will only support a democratically elected government. A Burby's father of three is shot in the head by her boyfriend. The reopening of the airports has been pushed back to August as COVID-19 hotspot Santa Rosa goes into total lockdown. And in sport, CWI director calls for Simmons sacking. President and coach clarify reason for leaving bubble. With the news, I'm Avinash Shramzan. Thank you for joining us. We started by telling you that the Caribbean Court of Justice, the CCJ, will rule next Wednesday in the case brought before it, seeking to quash the Court of Appeals' decision to interpret Article 177.2 of the Constitution to say the party for which more votes are cast should mean more valid votes are cast in determining the winner of the elections. The ruling set off a perverse interpretation by the caretaker coalition, which is clinging to its claim that only the votes the chief elections officer Keith Lowenfield deems to be valid or to be absolutely without question should be tabulated and form the basis of the results of the elections. That fear of the opposition was confirmed by Lowenfield's latest report, which denies it victory. The attorney for the original Court of Appeal applicant, Eslyn David, that's the Trinidadian senior counsel, John, uh, John Jeremy, admitted to the court that he could not find no instance in case law which shows that the election of a president was challenged even before the person was actually so declared and became president. Ordinarily, again, if you are raising before the Court of Appeal a question as to the validity of an election of a president, then the process should end with a determination either that the election is valid or that the election is in, invalid. That's the normal, the normal end of the process. But of course, in order for that to be the end of the process, you first have to have an election. So we are saying, we respectfully submit, when you interpret those words, the first impression that you get is that you have to be challenging and the election of someone. Somebody's election is under challenge. Somebody's election is being said to be invalid. And therefore, they, you would be interested to identify whose election. Because if you are making the application saying that somebody's election is affected, you first of all have to ensure that that person is before the court in order to um, in order to invalidate that person's election. It is interesting, of course, that Ms. David commenced these proceedings and did not name any presidential candidate at all. The Court of Appeal had jurisdiction, I but see. even if I am wrong, mm -hmm. I see that this court lacks the jurisdiction to entertain this appeal because the the clear and necessary intent of the Constitution and the agreement is that disputes of this type end in the Court of Appeal, even if the Court of Appeal was wrong on the question of jurisdiction. But Mr. Mr. Jeremy, so do I understand that, and this is hypothetical, but I need an answer to get an idea of your thinking. Uh, let's say that the Court of Appeal had said that um, we interpret this, uh, this phrase in the sense that only uh, if the candidate gets more invalid votes than the other, which would, of course, be quite absurd. But suppose they had said that. So then it is your opinion that, well, it may be absurd, it may be crazy, but that's what they said, so it's final. I, I just need to, to know um, where, if there are some limits, uh, at least in your thinking or not. My Lord, in respect of the so sovereign pronouncement by the Ghanese Parliament in enacting the CCJR and in respect of the provisions of the Constitution, I say with regret that on the authorities, as silly as that, that proposition is, and of course we are not dealing with that in this case, that's a hypothetical. The, what, what, what the Court of Appeal has said, as your Lordship has quite correctly put it, 
is that more votes means more valid votes. That's all that they have said. Mm -hmm. now, if, but if they had right. said that more votes means invalid votes, this court has no jurisdiction to, to trespass on, on that. The president of the Caribbean Court of Justice also had questions for Justice Simon, Queen's Counsel, who represented the Attorney General, Basel Williams. Mr. Simon, um, yes. this is a question which I, I, I wouldn't mind if you could help me with. Um, 177 4 speaks about the validity of the election of a, a president. President. Who is the person about whom a question was being raised as to the validity of their election as president? Well, to my mind, it was not the election of somebody as president, but the election of a president. And who is that person? Whoever it's going to be eventually, sir. Because what the process in that section of 177 provides for, especially we look at 177B, if there are two or more presidential candidates, which one of them is going to be elected as president? So it is not, to my thinking, that one, that one, Subsection 4 addresses a particular individual who has been elected. It does not. It does not, to my, to my thinking. It goes on to speak about the qualification of a person if we don't know the identity of the person. How can we begin to assess the qualification of someone whom we don't know, whom we can't identify. With respect, I do not think that that is a proper um, way to look at it, because if we look at the section, what it says clearly, insofar as that question depends upon the qualification of any person for election. So the qualification of any person for election presumes that there is a particular candidate and one looks at the qualifications of that candidate. Well, exactly. So what I'm asking is, who is that candidate in this case? In this particular case, which is before us, it would be either of the candidates. Former Speaker of the National Assembly and Senior Counsel Ralph Ramkaran called on the court to intervene with form orders that would bring an end to the four-month elections saga. Your Honours, I would respectfully seek your intervention in going a step further and not only ruling, not only setting aside the Court of Appeals decision, and ruling the direct consequence of that decision, namely the letter of the chief election officer of June the 23rd to be null and void. I respectfully seek your honor's intervention to say what are the valid results of these elections. This case is about the elections and this case is about the counting of the votes. And Section 96 and everything else points to the recount results being the valid results of this case. There is disputation about what the valid results are. And unless this court takes a position on what the valid results of the elections are, if this court seeks to kick the election can down the road and not to go down that road itself, we will be here very shortly. Not saying I will be here, but the issue will be here very shortly for this court to once again pronounce on the elections in Guyana. 
Your Honours, the affidavits and the material before Your Honours clearly demonstrate that this is a matter of great disputation in the country at the moment. I'm not asking Your Honours to seek any information outside of the parameters of this case. This case has all the evidence before, all the evidence before Your Honours as to the disputation. I'm merely asking Your Honours to take this material before you and pronounce on the elections results and bring this matter to a close once and for all. It's four months now. And the people of Guyana need relief from this torment. Opposition leader Barrett Jagdew and presidential candidate Irfan Ali through attorney Douglas Mendes argued that the Court of Appeal had no jurisdiction in the matter and that the motion that had been brought before it should be dismissed. Mendes argued that the question which had been raised by Eslin David was misplaced and premature because the article under the Constitution it hanged on concerned the qualifications of the election of someone's president. In this case, the elections machinery was yet to complete the process of declaring a president and so the Court of Appeal had no powers to hear and determine the case. He had argued that the definition of the Court of Appeal that more votes cast must mean more valid votes are cast was innocuous or without consequence. As Justice Shamada was inquiring, what's the reason for introducing valid in Article 177? It's simple. Fraudulent votes. The election produced fraud of an unprecedented scale in the history of elections in Ghana. And therefore, every precaution had to be taken to ensure that in the presidential elections also, in Article 177, that more votes cast, if more votes cast, should be crystallized. Uh, Mr. The Attorney General, this evidence was given by Ms. Davis in the matter below, that there was massive fraud in the elections, was it? Yes, please, Your Honours. I'm not sure why Mr. Mendes made it introduce the elements. In fact, it was I. I. With, all, with all due respect to the Attorney General, I see. I see. The, there was no evidence given. The only evidence that was given was, was the letters sent by Mr. Harmon to the Commission. There was no evidence. It was just letters that he had written making complaints. The Attorney General sought to get into the argument why there was need for the Court of Appeal to define what more votes cast in Article 177.2 means. At the end of the day, by putting in the word valid there and therefore assuming upon them, uh, assuming to themselves or arrogating onto themselves the qualitative and quantitative type of assessment that is provided for under the representation of the People Act, they were encroaching upon the exclusive jurisdiction of the High Court. And that is why we say that this, it is important for this court to correct that and to, to, um, uh, to make clear exactly what the, the functions of the Court of Appeal and the High Court are respectively in relation to the elections. We tell you now that the United States government on Wednesday again sounded a warning for those who seek to undermine democracy in Guyana. In congratulating Guyana's neighbor Suriname for completing its electoral process, the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo during a press conference streamed on the U.S. State Department Facebook page on Wednesday called on Guyana to get on with it. The U.S. high-ranking official said he has since instructed his department to ensure those who undermine Guyana's democracy are held accountable. And finally, to our hemisphere, all 21 OAS member states voted last week to condemn the Maduro regime's attempts to suppress independent political parties in Venezuela. Our region has categorically rejected the attempts to create a phony Maduro-friendly opposition. The United States also congratulates the people of Suriname in their elections and a peaceful transition of power to a new National Assembly. We look forward to working with that new government. In contrast, it's now been four months since Guyana's election long past due for a peaceful transition of power. CARICOM and the OAS have certified the recount results. They should get on with it. I've instructed my department to ensure those who undermine Guyana's democracy are held accountable. CARICOM and the OAS, which sent observers to oversee the national recount of all votes cast on March 2, have called for the election's results to be declared using the recount results. Several other countries have also called for an end to the over 100-day process. 
The national vote recount shows that the opposition People's Progressive Party won the elections by 15,416 votes. Chief Elections Officer Keith Lowenfield, in his latest report to the chairperson of GCOM, following the recount, gave the APNU AFC 171,825 votes and the PPPC 166,343 votes, invalidating 115,000 844 votes. His report was endorsed by the incumbent President David Granger, who has refused to concede defeat at the polls. Now, in wake of those calls, both locally and internationally, for President David Granger to concede defeat in the March 2, 2020 elections, he has responded to commentators saying he will not do so unless he's notified that he has lost the polls by the Ghana Elections Commission. More from Kurt Campbell. President David Granger's refusal to concede comes days after campaign manager for the APNU AFC coalition Joseph Harmon also rebuffed calls for Granger to accept defeat at the March polls. It was Harmon and other senior coalition members who have also claimed victory repeatedly in the election in the absence of a declaration from Cheekham and with figures from a national recount showing a victory for the opposition People's Progressive Party. But while the president has inadvertently offered his support to Harmon that he will not concede, he now says that he has never claimed victory in the elections. I cannot claim victory, which I have not done. And I con cannot concede defeat, which I have not done, unless I am notified formally by the Chairman of the Election Commission what the results of that uh, election of the 2nd of March, uh, 121 days ago, I think, over 17 weeks, um, have been. I don't know what the Election Commission will declare. Speaking with reporters at the sidelines of an event at State House on Wednesday, the president insisted on waiting for the official declaration from GCAM, and once that declaration is forthcoming, Mr. Granger said he will abide by it. Like all Guyanese, we have been subject to various reports, but the only authentic report will come from the Chairman of the Election Commission to me, and that has not happened. In that regard, I encourage all the spokespersons and commentators to wait patiently on the Chairman of the Elections Commission, who, when she is ready, will make a declaration. And I've said before, I'll abide by that declaration. Currently, the incumbent APNU AFC and the PPP are locked in a struggle about which party won the elections. The PPP has always maintained it won the elections and had pushed for a recount to be conducted after it suspected that Claremont Mingo, acting as the returning officer for District 4, inflated numbers to hand the coalition a victory. The coalition claims that the March elections were marred with anomalies and irregularities and wanted the polls annulled. Although the Carcom scrutinizing team found that the results from the recount were completely acceptable, the team said in its report that the flaws uncovered do not amount to an indictment on the March polls and urged that the results be declared based on the recount figures. The GCOM chair, former Judge Claudette Singh, had seemingly accepted this advice when she later instructed the chief elections officer to present his report to reflect the recount figures, which points to a victory for the PPP. Instead, Lowenfield presented another report and invalidated some 150,000 votes to give the APNU AFC a one-seat parliamentary majority victory. Asked for his response to persons who claim that he is ignoring Carcom's endorsement of the recount and for the declaration to be made on the basis of the recount figures, Granger said he has taken note of the recommendations of the report. The president seemed to be avoiding the other parts of the report, which insists that the elections were credible despite minor flaws. It was Granger who had previously said that Carcom was the most legitimate interlocutor. He said the Carcom report is only one part of the process, as he talked up the report of the CEO, which will constitutionally form the basis of which a declaration is to be made. Kurt Campbell, Newsroom. When the newsroom returns, the new army chief says the GDF will only support a democratically elected government and a Burby's mother of three is shot in the head by her boyfriend. Welcome back. This is the newsroom. The police are on the hunt for a man who fled the scene after shooting his girlfriend to her head on Wednesday morning at number 30 village West Coast Burby's Region 5. Injured is 28-year-old Devlin Garraway, a mother of three, who is currently battling for her life at the New Amsterdam Hospital. The newsroom understands that at approximately 9 hours 30, the suspect, who was identified as Julian Arter, went to the home of Garraway, where an argument ensued, 
after which he whipped out the gun and shot her. The bullet exited through her jaw. Newsroom understands Garraway wanted to end the relationship since the suspect became abusive. Brigadier Godfrey Bress on Wednesday officially assumed command of the Ghana Defense Force, the GDF, and in his initial remarks to the media, he made it clear that the GDF will only offer its support to a democratically elected government. Details from Kurt Campbell. The question was put to the new Chief of Staff Acting, Brigadier Godfrey Bess, about the GDF's position on democracy in the hemisphere. And in response, he reminded that the GDF has always been subordinate to civil societies and maintains a supportive role to civil authorities. He explained that the Army, in its subordinate role to civil society, also relies on legal advice and takes legal instructions. The Defense Force is always subordinate to civil authorities. And we do have a subordinate role and supportive role to the civil authorities. Um, we trained to support the democratic elected government of the day based on our constitution and that we will continue to do. Our relationship with the civil authorities is always subordinate and we take instructions, legal instructions. When pressed further on his new role as Army Chief and the GDF's support for any domestic political party that forms the government but was not democratically elected, Brigadier Bess said that the GDF is a professional organization and will stick to the Constitution of Guyana. His comments come amid Guyana's ongoing election impasse where after four months, Guyanese are still awaiting a declaration of the winner from the March 2, 2020 elections. The new army chief received his promotion to brigadier and instrument appointing him as chief of staff from president and head of the defense board, David Granger, at State House on Wednesday. He replaces brigadier Patrick West, who has already proceeded on pre-retirement leave and was notably absent from Wednesday's ceremonial activity. Brigadier West leaves come to an end in March 2021. Brigadier Best said he accepts the appointment with energy and intends to execute his duties as he is mandated by the law to do. He talked up training for ranks and the protection of the country's patrimony and borders amid anticipation that there will be challenges. And what do we do? What do we do when resources are minimal? Our training that we receive um, it helps us to create I would say opportunities, opportunities to fight against those challenges. So training in Guyana Defense Force, we take it seriously and it helps us in these times of challenges. Meanwhile, President David Granger called on the new Chief of Staff to collaborate and work with the General Staff to ensure that the transformation that has begun in the GDF continues to finality. He impressed on him the qualities of leadership and management and said those qualities cannot be mandated by law. The President said the government intends to ensure that the succession planning is maintained and offered his support and that of the Defense Board to the new Army Chief. The President also wished Brigadier Patrick West a happy retirement. Kurt Campbell, Newsroom. And President David Grange on Wednesday set aside comments made by his former Minister of Business and his son-in-law, Dominic Gaskin, saying he does not ha wish to comment on what the former ministers are saying. Gaskin, who is a member of the Alliance for Change, in two Facebook posts, one after the elections in March and another following the national vote recount, said, and I quote, there is no reasonable basis on which you, the APNU AFC, can claim to have won more votes than the PPP see in these elections, end quote. The president responded to this at the sidelines of an event held at State House on Wednesday. No, I don't have any comments on what former ministers say. I have comments on what active members say. They make statements on their own account. That is to say, the Guyana Action Party, the Justice for All Party, the National Front Alliance and the Working People's Alliance. I do not dictate what they say, although I have every expectation that what they say and do would be in accord with the principles of the uh, entire partnership. But Gaskin was not the only coalition member to score the APNU AFC. Another party in the six-party coalition, the Justice for All Party, also called on the coalition to concede defeat. Chandran Narayan Sharma, the leader, leader of the Justice for All Party, had conceded that the coalition was defeated and that the PPP is the clear winner.
The Justice for All Party has never been excluded, especially over the last 17 weeks, from any meeting of APNU. I am not responsible for what they say, but what I do know is that um, the APA, Justice for All Party acted on its own accord, and at our meetings, we have clearly outlined the policy of the partnership. And um, if it is at variance, well, you must ask the President and Secretary of the Justice for All Party um, and the members. The President said he does not know what was the motivation that allowed the Justice for All Party to make those statements. He rejected them as not being in accord with the matters which were discussed at the coalition level. Granger's running mate, Kamraj Ramjatan, had also conceded in a message to his staff that the coalition lost the elections to the PPP. The National Industrial and Commercial Investments Limited, NISL, on Wednesday transferred $250 million to the Ghana Sugar Corporation, Gaisuko, just as the company was considering laying off additional staff. Nissel, in a statement, said that the transfer represents a partial response to the corporation's request last month for a bailout. Nissel also released a signed letter as evidence of the transfer. The agency will soon transfer an additional $750 million to Gaisuko, the statement noted. Gaisuko, in early June, requested a bailout as it is faced with mounting debt, low production and the COVID-19 pandemic. The Ministry of Finance had said that the Treasury is not in a position to provide the money needed and promised to look at other means of funding. The community of Santa Rosa in the Maruca sub-district, Region 1, will be proceeding on a total lockdown from Saturday for two weeks as its COVID-19 cases increased to over 70 in the past week. Village leader Juanita Phillips, in a telephone interview with the newsroom, stated that some persons are still in denial that the disease exists and may be fueling the spread of such. We're trying to keep people in, the passenger boats from going out and coming in. However, we will allow one cargo boat to go out each week for the two weeks to bring in supplies which we are getting from donors, different organizations, campers, and so should be coming in for our village. So we will allow one cargo boat to go out and the medical boat, of course, in case of emergency and so on. Some are staying in, you know, coming out only when it's necessary. You're adhering with the rules. But there are some who are not adhering with the rules. Some, some of them are saying there is no coronavirus. You know, those are the ones that we're trying to work on and trying to, to get them to understand that it is serious. There is not a specific, um, specific age group. It varies. Because some of the elderly do not believe at all that there is coronavirus. Shops will be permitted to open from 8 to 11 hours from Monday to Friday so that persons can be able to purchase their necessities. During this time, limited vending will also be permitted. Santa Rosa is the most populated indigenous village in Guyana with approximately 12,000 residents and serves as the main economic hub for Maruca. Several persons have been donating items to the residents so they can provide for their families during a lockdown, but more persons are urged to contribute via the village council or the Amerindian People's Association. Now, Ghana's increasing cases of COVID-19 has forced the authorities to postpone the phased reopening of the Chari Jagan International Airport and the Eugene F. Karai International Airport to schedule commercial flights. As of June 30, Ghana recorded 245 COVID-19 cases, which includes 114 recoveries and 12 deaths. The airports have been closed to international flights since March 17, and authorities have since been accepting repatriation flights under certain conditions. The CJIA was scheduled to be reopened on July 1 to limited incoming flights for citizens, permanent residents, international workers and agencies and diplomats under a four-phase reopening plan. The phased opening has now been pushed to August 1, according to the Ghana Civil Aviation Authority. As such, no airline has been granted approval for the conduct of scheduled commercial operation. Now, grade 6 students across the country on Wednesday began writing the National Grade 6 Assessment, that's the NGSA, on the strict COVID-19 guidelines. According to the Ministry of Education, a total of 14,730 pupils registered to write the exams, which will transition them from primary to secondary schools. Necessitated by the countrywide efforts to prevent the spread of COVID-19, the NGSA exams are being administered with the strictest guidelines, which include physical distancing, washing of hands, wearing of masks, and temperature checks, among others. The public health measures were outlined 
in a gazetted and published examination order. The Assistant Chief Education Officer, Carol Ben, reported that a visit to the schools showed that they are in a state of readiness and there was a high attendance of students. Minister of Education Nicholas Henry on Wednesday encouraged the students to comply with the COVID-19 guidelines and to read their exam questions carefully before attempting to answer them. Students who do not write the NGSA will be allowed to write an entrance exam after spending one year in secondary schools closest to their homes. We now bring you the update from the Ministry of Public Health on Ghana's COVID-19 cases. Of the 56 tests that were done today, there are three new cases, which brings our total number of positive cases to 248. We are pleased to announce that 116 persons have recovered. The number of deaths remains at 12. In institutional isolation, we currently have 120 active cases. In institutional quarantine, we have 16. Number of cases in the COVID ICU is two. To date, we have tested 2,634 persons with 2,386 being negative. My fellow Guyanese, according to our statistics, regions one, four, and seven continue to have most of the cases. I wish to inform the residents, particularly in regions 1 and 7, that the ministry is working collaboratively with the various agencies within the region to address and help arrest the situation that is threatening to spiral out of control. We are calling on all residents to cooperate with the health officials as we work to contain the spread of the disease in your communities. Chinese I want you to know that COVID-19 is real. Stop, Mama Gayen. Please note also that the full effect of COVID-19 on the human body is not fully known. You can recover from the coronavirus disease, but may develop other conditions that you previously did not have, which can result in possible death. So my fellow Guyanese, let's follow the guidelines. We continue to say thank you to all of our health workers who continue to screen the population, provide testing for suspected cases, and treat the positive cases. Fellow Guyanese, we ask that you do your part. When the news returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sports. Sports.